The cladogram behind me is part of a perpetual work in progress, with only a very few volunteers reviewing and comparing existing phylogenies and transcribing that data into this system over the last couple of years. This tree is filling out pretty well. In fact, this may already be the broadest and most robust rendering of this kind ever done. We're still building onto it all the time, and we're now beginning the next phase of that, which includes illustrations and encyclopedic data. But that'll take a lot longer, and this will never be complete, because we endeavor, with additional assistance, to include every species ever discovered, extant or extinct, in every lineage on every continent across the eons of geologic time. And that is a vast undertaking. If there was only one thing I could impress upon someone looking at any part of this already extensive cladogram, it is the sheer volume of paleofauna we have in the Tree of Life. The goal of the Phylogeny Explorer project is not to focus on the species as so many other cladograms do, but rather to show the meanings and importance of the sequence of clades leading up to them, illustrating the stages of their evolution, as this video series explains. But with that said, you still have to be impressed at all the different species already represented here. I mean, there are so many. And yeah, I know that there's a million species alive in the world today, but these are not alive in the world today. The ancestors of every mammal that is alive today made their way on just one thread, winding through all these other forms that are now entirely extinct. All of them. We can say the same thing about every amphibian and every reptile, including the last surviving dinosaurs, more commonly known as birds. Think about that. Every lineage of all the species on every page of this sequence is dead except for one single line coursing through all of these, the one that survived every sequential extinction event and subsequently subdivided to diversify into every mammal we have today. It is so rare that anything dies in just the right conditions to get fossilized that it's amazing we have, that we're aware of any paleofauna at all. Yet we keep finding new species that we didn't know anything about before. And some are represented by no more than fragments from a single individual, where you know there had to have been several thousand at least just to be a viable population. Yet we found thousands and thousands of fossilized individuals representing so many extinct genera that it is a fair estimate that the million or so animal species that are alive now represent only 1% of all the species that have ever lived. There is a profound history of biodiversity that precedes humanity, where we are newcomers to the scene, yet having no clue as to the world's real age or our actual level of importance in it or to it, we had the audacity to imagine that it was just created, just for us. And in some stories, we were even the first ones here. And here we are at Mammalia Morpha. You're probably excited because you think we're 23 episodes into this series and we finally come to mammals, but not quite yet. Although these are the shape of things to come. The meaning of both Mammalia morpha and Mammalia forms refers to the shape of mammals, or what are shaping up to be mammals. And some of these things are so close, they're virtually mammals. The only thing that separates them from true mammals are technicalities. But as much as these may look like mammals generally, these still aren't like any particular mammal you've ever seen. Let's take a look at Tritylodontidae. You've probably never heard of these before, and almost no one has, because they're all dead now. But in the Triassic period, these critters spread to every continent, including Antarctica. Tritylodonts are largely omnivorous and many herbivorous. They had a very powerful bite with enormous jaw muscles, but even though they were cynodonts, which were famous for their fangs, Tritylodonts didn't have their canines anymore. Instead, they just had incisors that were more like that of rodents. And the name Tritylodont refers to the three rows of cusps in their cheek teeth, perfect for grinding plants. Their grinding teeth were a bit tougher than ours, too, having up to six roots each. So imagine forests populated with strange-looking, egg-laying rodents that really aren't rodents. They're about the size of rodents. Where some therapsids were once as big as bears, most were only the size of dogs and then cats and now rats. The line of proto-mammals kept trending smaller as the dinosaurs kept trending larger. It's funny that when I was a little boy, now, people thought that dinosaurs were cold-blooded, slow-moving, sluggish beasts that had to live in swamps so that the water would support their enormous weight. And the only reason they were dominant at that time was because their then inexplicable size, obviously from overabundant food, made them too big to kill until the climate changed. But we thought then that something as mild as cold weather or droughts were enough to kill off the dinosaurs because we thought they were so poorly designed that they could only survive as long as the environment was perfectly stable and comfortable. That was the stereotype about 
why the dinosaurs died out, because they were fat and lazy, couldn't adapt, and couldn't keep up when the times changed. That's what I was told a half century ago. Since then, we learned that all that is completely wrong. We had it backwards. Dinosaurs were equipped with avian respiration through pneumatic skeletons, so they could draw more oxygen than mammals could, making them more energetic. And they could get a hell of a lot bigger than terrestrial mammals because dinosaur bones are hollow tubes, much lighter and stronger than mammal bones, which are relatively solid and full of marrow. So a dinosaur the size of an elephant would be a lot lighter and stronger and faster than an elephant. And they could maintain that energy level for a lot longer, too. Any dinosaur of the same size as an elephant could run an elephant down and tear it up. No contest. Dinosaurs generally win against any mammal of equal mass until you get small enough that the mammal's extra weight actually becomes an advantage. Ornithodirons, dinosaurs and pterosaurs, were the most efficient vertebrates ever to walk the earth, much better designed than we are. So there was no way mammals could compete against them. All we could do was get out of their way and clean up after them, so we went underground and kept to the shadows, kind of like the way big city rats deal with humans now. They say every dog has his day. Therapsids were once on top before the dinosaurs, and we know they all got another chance eventually. And although birds are technically dinosaurs, they can't assume their previous position because they're disadvantaged by flight. They either have to be light enough to fly, or if they're too big for that, their former wings can't be used as arms anymore. They're too specialized to diversify the way their ancestors did. And looking back at our own tree, we see quite a few shrew-like mammaliomorphs. One of particular interest here is Adelibacellus, sometimes called the oldest mammal. It's not quite a mammal yet, but it's almost there. And it's the closest of all these, because in addition to warm blood and fur and all that, it shares another specifically mammalian trait. They have highly specialized occluding cheek teeth, either for shearing or grinding. And notice that when you clench your jaw, your own teeth at least should sink together perfectly. And then we have Morganocodon, representing another important stage in the evolution of mammals. We have quite a few fossils of these from individuals of various ages, enough to know they were born toothless, implying that they were raised on mother's milk. And what's more mammalian than that? That's the most diagnostic of all mammalian traits. But Morganocodon had one more, too. Where reptiles, amphibians, and fish might wear a tooth down or break it off and replace it again and again and again throughout their lives, mammals are diphodont, meaning they have only one set of deciduous baby teeth to be replaced only once by a single set of adult teeth that you hope are going to be permanent, but very often aren't. It's a significant flaw in our design. So if your dentist says that's a concern for you, too, then... Do you accept that the way your molars match up and mash up and the way they're lost and naturally replaced only once, that you're in the same shape as a mammalian morph, shaping up to be a mammaliform?